Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today and as always by my, my dear friend, uh, Mr. Jason Neal Patrick Harris Johnston Yellen uh, on this here Wednesday. How are you doing, Jason? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you f- for always inviting me in. It'd be kind of weird if I didn't invite you in, right? It would be very awkward. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. I would just sit here, watch you host a podcast, and uh, I just kind of wait for things to happen in front of me. But I don't have to. I don't have to imagine a world like that. So, listen, you and I have a number of whiskey things to talk about, but I've got, uh, I've got a question for you. And this this question mm-hmm. popped in my head today. Um, mm-hmm. After about two months of searching for a thing, my oh, question gosh. to you is, do you, Jason, Neil, Patrick, Harris, Johnston, Yellen, believe in ghosts? Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be fucking ridiculous. You don't believe in ghosts at all? Do you do you believe in like uh energies or or or, or at least there are things I, I that we don't know. I believe in energy. Physics has physics has proven energy to me. <laughs> what about mass? Do you do you believe in <laughs> <laughs> the state, not the not the velocity. Uh, yeah. I am a big <laughs> believer in velocity. I am all over velocity. Well, I'll tell you this. So, so you and I travel a fair bit yep. for work and sometimes for pleasure. Mm-hmm. The more I travel, and the more the number of flights I've taken in my life increases. And I have touch wood, clunk, clunk, never had any issue with any airplane ever. Oh, jeez, Jason, we're about to go on a trip. You're not meant to say any of this. <laughs> Every single time we take off, yeah, I say, come on, physics, don't let me down. You're, you're undefeated. Let's keep it up. And when we land, you just say, oh, thank physics. Hundred percent, hundred percent. When I when I applaud on landing, I'm applauding physics. The oh, laws of yeah. physics have remained under me. I do not applaud. Don't continue talking there. Like, oh, that's why you applaud. I do not applaud when the plane lands. Are you an applauder when the plane lands? I am not an applauder when the plane lands because you know what happened. The pilot has done his or her job. That's what's happened. <laughs> That's all this happened. Next, I mean, you'll be saying, next you'll be saying you don't tip your pilot on the way out. I do. I tip him all the time. Brush and floss three <laughs> times a day. <laughs> what better tip can you get? But listen, so you like, you, you know, instead of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, is it like, you know, energy, velocity, <laughs> mass? Like, wh- what's going on here? Yeah, I'm very much E equals MC squared. <laughs> That's very much me. <laughs> For me, it's it's milk, milk, lemonade around the corner of the fudge is made. No, listen, the reason I ask you if you believe in ghosts. See, every time you say, do you believe, all I can think of is, do you believe in life magic. after love? That's oh. all I can hear. Do you believe in life after love, after love, after love? After love? Oh, if you I... can auto-tune that, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> I can't, but I can wear that that bathing costume. That leotard or whatever, whatever it was that she was wearing. The duct tape and if I could turn back time, which we have discussed on we this discussed, podcast yes. before. Um, Probably more than once. We've discussed it to completion. No, so listen, um, here's the reason I asked the question. Yes. And, and do I believe in ghosts? I, you can I tell believe, I didn't ask the question. Richard. Yeah, I know. I'm not going to go there. Let's just say you and I. I don't know. Uh, okay. Anyway, so the reason I'm asking you this question is about two months ago, I had lost my wedding ring. Gone. Ooh. Couldn't find Ooh. it. To be fair, that is what happens when you take it off every time you go on a business trip. <laughs> so. So here's the thing. I remember taking the ring off and I, and here's the thing. I would take it off while I was on a plane because, 
your body kind of swells up, you start retaining water, you get dehydrated, and it's just uncomfortable on the finger. And so I remember taking the ring off and putting it into a very specific pocket in my backpack. Mm. I then get home Mm. and I look for said ring and said ring is missing in action. And then There's nothing like telling your wife why you took off your wedding ring. There's nothing like that rush. You could go parachuting, skydiving, deep sea scuba diving for the rest of your life. Nothing is as much of an adrenaline rush as telling your wife why you're not wearing your wedding ring. Well, I tell you, I had to tell her that I lost it. I just searched fucking <laughs> every – I searched every imaginable place there was. And and I and I couldn't find it, and so I finally had to say, "Look," I, I told her. I said, "Look, I lost my wedding ring." You know what her response was? Get me to a nunnery. She said, no, she said again. And I didn't I didn't okay. lose it before. Anyway, <laughs> she's very cool about it. She's like, "All right." And the fact of the matter is, it was a thirty five dollar titanium ring that she got free shipping on back in two thousand four. So it's not. <laughs> It wasn't, you know, it's not platinum. I like the detail it's, of free shipping. You got free shipping. <laughs> that sold her if you, on it. If you, if you don't think that <laughs> ring's cheap enough, let me tell you about the free shipping that I got with it. And, uh, and so I had to tell her, and she was like, uh, okay, at least it's not, you know, at least we're not out a lot of money. And I said, it's not about that. It's about the fact that this is the my wedding ring. She's like, no, I, I, I get it. Like, she's... I'm more sentimental than than she is. Like she is. That's just not my wife. Anyway, just yet. regular listeners who have tuned into the Thanksgiving episodes are nodding their head right now. <laughs> <laughs> so the other day, I'm packing my bag to visit a local bar here, a place called Scottish Dave's in in Clinton, run by a nice Scottish man from Glasgow, and. Awesome. And I'm packing it with a bunch of Glenalkey bottles, right? Because uh, he, he's interested in some Speyside whiskeys, or at least that's what I remember. So I go to my bottom shelf. And if you remember my whiskey shelves, they're about <laughs> seven bottles across uh-huh. and four to five bottles back. Uh-huh. So you can fit a lot on each shelf. I got to the back of that shelf and found my ring in the back behind everything. I don't know how it could have... I mean, granted, I believe in physics. I believe it dropped somewhere and it bounced back there and so on and so forth. (laughs) But it's just one of those things. How does... You know, how do we keep on losing socks in the laundry? How do we keep on losing pen caps? Like, how does this wedding ring show up in a place that makes no sense on a shelf I haven't been to? And like, what's up? Socks lost in the laundry is my favorite episode of Erie, Indiana. Oh, is that a thing? Erie, Hmm. Indiana. God, an amazing show. I do own uh, all seasons on DVD. Do you remember Erie, Indiana? I don't know Erie, Indiana. I thought Erie was in Pennsylvania. Oh, dude, you have... Oh, my gosh. This show is so up your alley. You've never seen Erie, Indiana? Is it a scripted show? Is it an American show? Yeah. Is it... Yeah, 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 yeah. Scripted, American, maybe the very early 90s. How do I not know um, this? Yeah, central character is a maybe a high school kid and his his buddy who's a little bit kind of weird and there's always weird sightings in his town. It is so your kind of show. I actually think for a while Amazon Prime had it. Oh, okay. uh, if if you wanted to go seek it out there, but you know, aside from it being a bit dated for being thirty years old, it's it's a cracking little show. So so a it almost. Yeah, almost like a Twilight Zone for kids. Ah, uh, oh. So is this for kids? Is this going to be like an R.L. Stein Goosebumps kind of situation? <laughs> kind of. It's it's a. I think it's a little more mature than that, but okay. not by much. Okay. So, and we're talking maturity with your lemonade lemonade joke. So, I, right. I think it's pitched right at you, right at you. It's milk, milk. Lemonade. Milk, milk. Yeah. And around milk, the corner. Milk, sorry. Yep. So, <laughs> Every time you start saying that one, I stop listening. So I always forget the right order. So, A, I will check out this show. 
Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie, Indiana. Erie, Indiana. B, he seemed to dodge it. I brought up potential evidence of a ghost. <laughs> I was and, and potential even, evidence even, of a ghost. <laughs> Like, is it weird? Uh huh. Absolutely. Is is it challenging? Absolutely. Is it obvious how it happened? Absolutely not. But see, when I watch Penn and Teller, I go, "Wow, well, how did they possibly do that? That makes no sense." But I know it happened according to the laws of physics. All right. If you say so. I don't go. Well, they're real magicians. They are wizards. Burn them. <laughs> Well, Penn is uh, Gryffindor and Teller's uh, Hufflepuff. Like, is that true? I don't know. Uh, all right. Listen, we do have some business to get to. So, A, we have an interview that, that I want us to get to. Uh, but before that, I know you've got a bit of news, but there was an email that came in uh, just off the back of our last Extra Extra where we were talking about sort of the changing landscape or or the modern spirits business with sort of a focus on on scotch whiskey right because that's that's our focus to, is is scotch whiskey and, and we 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 sort of used Glen Farkless and Springbank as sort of the the two examples of man who is doing it like these people nowadays kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. For those of you that aren't familiar with this episode of Extra Extra, please go back, check it out. It's it's a, a tight 35 minutes and it's a... Very tight. Uh, I thought it was an excellent conversation, uh, partially because I spoke a lot, so it's got to be good. Um, Oof. <laughs> no, I, I just... I've forgotten that detail. <laughs> it, it was just a conversation that's really apropos to, not just to our business, but I think to... A lot of other small businesses that that focus on 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 spirits. So anyway, off the back of that, Michael Nolan sent in uh, an email to us, calling us out on something, and uh, and we'll, we'll get to <laughs> Good that. Good old Michael Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the the subject is extra extra season four episode sixteen. He goes, gentlemen. I just listened to the Extra Extra episode where you extensively discuss Glenn Farkless and Springbank. I was really surprised that during this entire discussion, the passing of Headley Wright was not mentioned. Possibly you recorded mm. it before he passed. He was a massive contributor to the promotion of Campbelltown, single malt whiskey, and to independent bottling that his death surely needs to be covered in some future form of the podcast, especially considering the fact that he has left the distillery and Caddenheads to the people of Campbelltown. This was done to ensure the distillery was left in good hands and to continue to provide the community with good jobs. May his memory be a blessing. Hear, hear to that. Mm, uh, absolutely. Peace, Michael. So, yeah, listen, Michael, um, the news of Mr. Wright's passing came, if not later in the day that we recorded, the next morning. So, yeah, it, it was just something that that no one had known at the time of our yeah. recording outside of those close to the Wright family in, in Springbank and, and I'm sure likely a number of people in Campbelltown. So. Yeah, if we'd happened to have known that and we were busy talking about Springbank, gosh, we, we wouldn't even have just brought it in as a tangential comment, we would likely have led with that information. That, that may is... have been the news of the week. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Although although one thing I will add, you know, to to the passing of Mr. Wright is he was an incredibly private man. Mm -hmm. And in all of our conversations with people attached to Springbank, Caden Heads, uh Campbelltown itself, he never wanted to talk about himself he never wanted to be the focus of of any conversation he wanted the distillery to do the talking for itself he now he was inordinately proud of Campbelltown being a region and oh, he yes. did not want that to go away famously the opening of Glengyle <laughs> to give Campbelltown three working distilleries yep. uh, to go along with the number in the lowlands at that time mm -hmm. so 
So yeah, he was a, a champion of whiskey, a champion of independent bottling, a champion of Campbelltown. And, and while his leadership will clearly be missed, he set up things to be well run and to be properly run after his death. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry that we now live in a post Headley Wright world, but the distillery, the independent bottler, Kinheads, will all be incredibly well taken care of. And the people of Campbelltown. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, well said, Jason. Well well said. I don't think I can say anything further beyond that. Um, you ever meet him? You know, I haven't. I haven't. Have you? I once walked past him. And, and this was outside the new Springbank uh, shop. Oh, okay. And, and I just went past him. He was in his tweeds. He had his <laughs> cane or his walking stick. Yeah. And he was just kind of paying attention to the people milling around the distillery. He wasn't talking to anybody. He wasn't standing beside anybody. He was just mm. absorbing it, just taking it in. And uh, and it was only once I was passed, I think someone had said to me, you know, that's Mr. Wright himself. I was like, oh, gosh. All right. Yeah. Well, I at least stood in his vicinity without you know <laughs> going back and talking to him or introducing myself. Yeah, right. Which is not a thing I would do. It's it's one of those people that, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. you would have taken two seconds to say, Mr. Wright, I know you want to get on with your day. I just want to say, thanks for what you've done for Scotch Whiskey. Thanks for what you've done for Campbelltown, right? It's, I do that every once in a while. I'm really scared to meet, or I get nervous around meeting, like, famous people or just people of note, period. But I've gotten to the point where I said... Be most not I'm afraid to meet them. I'm afraid to take their time because they're mm-hmm. quite often out there just trying to be humans, right? Period. <laughs> right. And so I've taken to just, if I have the chance to pass them, just pausing and saying, excuse me, Mr. So-and-so, Ms. So-and-so, I just want to say thank you for what you've done. You've brought me a lot of joy. Enjoy the rest of your day and move on. And that's it. And uh, and I've done that a few times. And I was uh, going to say you just had that with someone. Who was your most recent when you were in New York? Was it? It was one of the guys from um, Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, the the guy who basically is in charge of operating the ship, ensuring that it can go like blink from one spot to the next. Absolutely lovely guy. He was there with I don't know if it's his partner or his husband, but. Just a fun couple eating Chinese food along with me, kosher dim sum. And uh, <laughs> it's like, hey. And unfortunately, what I hadn't realized is he had just jammed food in his mouth. And so it was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Talk about being out there just trying to live your life as a human. <laughs> ram, ram, ram. So hungry. Ram, 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 ram. You're welcome, stranger. Ram, 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 ram. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, to, to echo what, what Michael said, may, may Headley Wright's memory uh, be a blessing. Yeah. It's, uh, he, well earned, he worked hard. Um, to, to transition yeah. over just a, a wee bitty, because I know we want to get to this interview. Previously, this season, we interviewed Bill Thomas at Jack Rose. Mm-hmm. Bill and I talked about the upcoming Premier Drams event at Jack Rose in DC. He named it as the first weekend of July. <laughs> We went to print. It did not happen. We did announce at a later episode that it hadn't happened. Tickets had never gone on sale. Mm -hmm. But when we knew more, we would say more. I am very pleased to say that tickets are on sale for the October 1 event. Mm -hmm. Premier Drams happening at Jack Rose Dining Saloon in Adams Morgan in DC from 1 till 4 in the afternoon. Tickets are $145 per person, which I think for three hours of dramming where we, you know, we'll be exhibiting there. Single Cast Nation will be there. Mm -hmm. Impex will be there. I'm guessing we'll see Jared Card down there. Oh yeah, I'm sure. We as exhibitors pull out the stops, A, because it's Bill Thomas and Jack Rose, B, this event has always been a celebration of Harvey Fry. Mm. And 
Yeah. You know, curmudgeonly old bastard who we all <laughs> desperately wanted to impress yeah. with our casks, <laughs> with our selections. Mm-hmm. And so, let me say here, I've said it previously, but I will I will repeat. If you are at Jack Rose Premier Drams event on October 1 and you swing by where I'm pouring, tell me that you are here for the Harvey Fry Dram and I will have something that is not on general offer to f- to pour for people mentioning Harvey's name. And let me say, this dram is a celebration of Harvey Fry's palate and his likes. If you know anything about Harvey Fry, you may be able to surmise what I will have for pouring, but you must, must, must mention Harvey by name to get the special pour. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, I only wish I could be there with you. It would be awesome. It's a it's a great event to attend. Kill, it's a great event to walk, and I've never yet walked it. I will say though, we we've had Chanel on here, you know, a fair few times. Uh she also did the the Triple M with us when we watched Purple Rain with her. Uh when she was still in the US uh, was still known to me as Nelly, and she was working for that boutique whiskey company. She was running drams over to me, uh, uh, where I was pouring single cast nation, and and that was incredibly kind of her. The yeah. old days of the jubilee when you were working the floor and you would bring drams mm-hmm, back to me mm-hmm. uh, when I was working single cast nation tables. So there's good things out there. Uh, I never get to see Jared during the event. He never gets to see me. Um, we sometimes share a wee dram together before it all kicks off. So. There you go. There you go. One last bit of business before we get into the interview with uh, William Dobby, by the way, who's the commercial director for Isle of Rase Distillery, also part of the family, part of the ownership of the distillery. On October 7, as part of mm. the Dramming, which is Drammers Club 10th anniversary in Manhattan, on October 7, uh, Charlie's going to be renting out a venue called Drom, Drom NYC, and Kimono Dragon is going to be playing at the Dramming. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to come check out my band, if you say us, if you say nice things about us, I'll pour the special Jason Neil Patrick Harris Johnston Yellen pour. <laughs> Uh, October 7th, that'll be fun. Yeah, yep. Looking forward to that. So anyway, I'm sure I'm sure if you if you are a member of Drammers, I'm sure you'll hear more about this sort of stuff through Charlie or just through his mailing list. If you're not a member of Drammers, go check it out, Drammers.com. Um it's a global whiskey society that, that both Jason and I are members of. And uh, they now have a retail partner, plus a bunch of single casts that they do. And there may be a cheeky wee Drammers exclusive SCN bottling coming out uh, within the next five to 35 (laughs) months. Um, So, you know, so keep an eye on that. Um, (laughs) I think in the future is the safer way to say that. (laughs) Future, future. All right. So listen. I'm done with the news. I'm done with emails for now. There's going to be one a little later. Shall we <laughs> Shall we hand it off to my conversation with uh, William at Isle of Raze? Yeah. Do you Do you kind of give the listener an introductory uh, passage on William before you start talking to him? Of course, Jason. <laughs> what am I? Uh, what am I? An amateur? Firstly, cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much, Joshua. Yeah. Pleasure to have you here. William, do you prefer William? Do you go by Will? Do you go by Bill? It's a long answer to that one. <laughs> uh, no, either or, to be honest. Right. William probably most commonly, yep. uh, but Will too. There's uh, just whatever you think of first. Okay. Yeah. I ask because technically I'm a Joshua, and I say to people, Hi, I'm Joshua, and they say, Hi, Josh. <laughs> does that does that grate you? I mean, in the end, no. My wife calls me <laughs> Josh. Like I, I can't get upset, and it's just so easy. But 
Like if if someone says to you hi, like if you say hi, I'm William, and they say hey Bill. Yeah, but I think Bill is a push. I think that's All right. that's one step too far. Yeah. Because it's a completely different name. <laughs> it is a completely different yeah. name. It's very familiar. Yeah. So I would William or Will's perfect. William okay. usually. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. William, thank you for being on One Nation Under Whiskey. Thank you very much. Um, for our listeners who may not know, William Dobby is with Isle of Rossi. Well, you should know this. You've looked at our masthead. You've looked at the the link on our on on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your stuff. So you know we've got William Dobby of Rossi. Rossi is a a somewhat newer distillery. I think you started distilling in. 2015 or started building in 2015 and distilling in 2017 so yeah yeah so we started we were founded in founded in 2014 um, and we started construction of the distillery in 2015 yeah and our first distillation was September 2017 ah okay so if if I rewind the clock a little bit to July of 2017. I was at the West Coast Whiskey Fage with Chris Hoban. Yep. And there was a Rase table, and I think he was pouring while we wait. Yeah, that would have been on the on the eve of our uh, first distillation, and yeah, before we um, well started distilling whiskey on Rase, and then subsequently released released yeah. it to the market. We had a independently bottled whiskey that was. Uh, kind of a demonstration of the style of whiskey that we mm. wanted to bring out from Rassi and really it was a way for us to get the name out there and you know yeah. all of our team are, are new to or were very new to the industry at that point in time and it was a way for us to start to understand um, yeah the market and and uh, and get the name out yeah yeah I, I want to come back to that in a minute because I think I think that's a I think that approach is quite an unusual one. But before we get to that, I think we're living in an unusual time where whiskey, modern whiskey consumers actually give a shit about new distilleries and are quite interested in following the revolution. So I wonder if you could just, for a, li- for a listener's sake and for my sake, give us a rundown of, of, what, of what this looked like from from conception of distillery on an island that I don't think has ever had distillation of any sort, maybe not legally, yeah. to where you are today? Like, where did this idea develop? How did you get the approvals? What are the steps one takes to start a distillery on a place where distilling had never happened before? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, brace yourself for two hours of a <laughs> monologue. Uh, no, no, no. So, uh, we, um, so the distillery was, was co-founded by two uh, individuals, uh, Bill Dobby, who is my father, and Alistair mm. Day, uh, his business partner, our business partner. Um, and this was back in 2014. Mm. And the he way was with the Tweeddale blend, right? Yeah, Alistair exactly. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Alistair has a family history in blending. Yeah. Um, and his, the history of his family, his great grandfather, Richard Day had a blending and bottling business, a grocer's down yeah. in Coldstream in the Borders. Yeah. Um, and it, that, that business dates back to 1820. Mm. And Alistair, while he didn't work in whiskey before creating the Tweedale blend, which, mm-hmm. which I'll come on to in a sec, um, he inherited uh, what, what, what his family called the Cellar Book, which is hmm. it's a sales ledger from his great-grandfather's uh, grocery shop and it has all of the different blends and bottlings that they would sell to different customers Um, and it actually has lists of all the different distilleries that they would source liquid from and put together for ABC customer you know they would say okay a spot of this distillery and a spot of that and so on in a a blend so um, Alistair inherited that and uh, I believe the story goes his father said like you can have the seller book, but you have to do something about it. Okay. Uh, if I'm going to gift this to you, so um, Alistair, I think this was 2009, um, recreated one of the blends mm-hmm. in that uh, book called the Tweeddale, mm-hmm. and he set about selling that and introducing that to to various whiskey uh, enthusiasts and whiskey lovers around sure. the world. 
So Alistair uh, was working on uh, selling the Tweeddale blend for a number of years from 2009, uh, you know, for at least a good five years. Um, and he was starting to, as whiskey was becoming more popular, mm. starting to find it more and more difficult to purchase stock, as, as lots of people were. Yep. And so he figured, hey, do you know what? Um, for the amount of money that I want to buy XYZ casks uh, with, I could potentially build a small distillery huh. down in the borders. So yeah. Alistair set about putting together a business plan for a distillery based in the borders. Um, oh, okay. And the whole thinking behind that was that could create liquid that could then, you know, sustain the, the Tweedle brand and potentially sure. other brands going forward. In trade, if you need yeah, exa- to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So at that point in time, I think this was about, I believe, 2013, 14. Um, at, the, at the same time, um, my old man, my, my dad, Bill, um, was wanting to uh, build a kind of long-term intergenerational family business which mm. um, you know he had sort of set about figuring out what that may be yeah. and uh, and when you're Scottish and you, you ask yourself hey you know what's a good long term intergenerational family business <laughs> and, uh, and what's Scotland good at I mean we're uh-huh. not great at football and we're getting a wee bit better at rugby but uh, <laughs> you know I think it's fair to say we're okay at whiskey yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so he decided separately to, to build a whiskey distillery as well Um, and through that process though his background is um, as an entrepreneur for want of a better word in the tech industry and so the what industry? technology oh tech tech I heard tank industry like uh, like little bit Sherman different. tanks, like it is, okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, no, he did not sell arms to people. Let's just make that clear, okay? okay? <laughs> Software and things like that, gotcha, but not okay. no that arms, no arms. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. cool. And uh, and so through that process, he he was trying to find somebody who he could partner with who would uh, be able to help with the whiskey making side of things, mm. and that's when he met Alistair, uh, and okay. both of them came together at, at that point in time and um, and I'll come on to how Rassi came into the picture because yeah. you've, you know, you've got Alistair with uh, business plan for the borders, being introduced to my old man who was looking to build a whiskey distillery yeah. and um, through that period of time, you know, things don't just happen instantaneously, discussion mm-hmm. and this, that, the next thing and, uh, and my dad was with his mates, um, they were actually out drinkings funnily enough uh, and uh, checks out yeah. he was talking to a group of them and uh, and he was saying oh yeah I'm thinking of building a whiskey distillery and most of them said are you effing mad you, you know <laughs> people don't build whiskey distilleries and uh, huh. and he said but I'm not sure where and you know they were kind of just spitballing ideas and then okay. his best mate from school they've been friends since they were like five years old Ian Hector Ross um, and Ian's actually works with us today he's part of the, the oh, sales okay. team um, and does kind of local sales around the Highlands and Islands. Gotcha. But uh, Ian said, when, when my dad said, oh, I'm wondering where to build one, Ian said, I know the exact place, uh, Rassi. And, you know, sort of half the room goes, where? And, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and Ian goes, because Ian's wife, Marion's from Rassi, and he said, look, come and I'll show you this, this yeah. island. It's magical, and it's the perfect place to, to build a distillery. And so mm-hmm. he took my dad up, and uh, I think this must have been sometime in 2014 or 2015 or early 2015 and he took my dad up and there was an old disused hotel which uh, used to belong to a couple that I think was as I understand it things didn't go uh, too well in the relationship and anyway the hotel was was uh, (laughs) was was for sale okay and um, on that day they they bought the hotel and uh, and then my dad actually went back to Alistair and said hey Alistair you know really interested in in the way you're approaching whiskey making Mm. and you know Alistair had a really which will come on to a really compelling kind of uh, ethos around the production of whiskey yeah Um, but he said hey Alistair how about you come and look at this place in terms of a location to to build a distillery Uh, and took Alistair up to Rassi and I think for both of them um, the the penny kind of dropped and uh, and they you know you only have to go to Rassi to to, to see how amazing a place it is Stunning. and how kind of magical it is and I think yeah. and they both decided to look let's build a distillery here on Rassi yeah. and 
the borders uh, concept is still very much a long-term ambition of oh, ours as a okay. company. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the you know what we said to ourselves at the time was, look, let's build the distillery on Rassi first. Mm-hmm. Let's get that kind of humming. Yeah. And we're 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 pegging away at trying to do that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, and then we'll come to the kind of other plans down the line. So yeah. that's actually our, our company name is called R and B Distillers. R and B means Rassi and Borders. And initially uh, meant Rassi and Borders. And so the company was okay. founded with yeah. the concept of let's build a distillery on Rassi yeah. and then build a distillery in the Borders sure. as Alistair had originally planned. So, yeah. um, so as I said, a bit of a long answer to, the, to, to a short question. No, but that's, uh, so, that's, okay. how, that's how we came to, to, to deciding on Rassi. So you've decided on Rassi at this point. And again, a very... Uh, untraditional place for distilling as, as far as you know when you presented your planning permit your 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 planning to whomever you need to do that to like what what does that look like when you say we want to build a distillery here by the way there's never been a distillery here mm-hmm. like what obstacle does that put in front of you I think fortunately at the time and there were there were some issues through the planning process but it was more related to we had a, a bat colony that was located in the in the building which delayed the process for a, what? For a bat colony oh a bat uh, colony bats okay. in, yeah. in the, I don't know if I'm using the correct term for a no, group no, no, of bats but yeah, that's, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I um, heard you correctly which actually that delayed the process a year through planning but really? that's, that's a separate separate okay. thing I think fortunately for us you know in the, in terms of if you want to call it the new wave of Scotch whiskey distilleries, yeah. we were reasonably early on in, yeah. in the planning process and we were building on an island which had never had a, yeah. a legal distillery anyway. And, um, you know, so there, there weren't necessarily the same concerns of overcrowding of, of distilleries to a certain location. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, in fact, the, the job creation that it, was, that it has mm-hmm. um, and, and was planned to to kind of um, drive was, you know, made things, I think, a little bit more um, smooth in terms of the acceptance of, of yeah. the concept of a distillery on Rassi. Oh, okay. um, as I said, things got a little bit bumpy along the road <laughs> during the during the planning process, but, yeah. you know, overall, generally, it was well-received at the time. Okay. Um, and aside from the planners, one of the key groups of people to, to bring in, and the, the, my dad and Alistair, uh, spoke to you know and and socialized the idea with very early on was the locals mm. on Rassi yeah. and so um, you know they, they they presented plans as early as possible and and made sure that people I think uh, you know had the opportunity to to kind of input or discuss mm. or mm-hmm. or yeah just you have ask questions where, where, wherever they were any sure so I, I realized that it, I may have asked this of Ian Robertson mm-hmm. before when he was when he was distilling with you, but I think it'd be a good reminder because you t- we talked about while we wait, yeah, which was an interesting concept where you guys weren't distilling yet, but you independently created a specific blend, a single malt, yeah, to say this is the style we're looking to emulate once we come online around right is that is that yeah, a fair yeah. so, statement so we you know aside from Al- Alistair recreating the Tweeddale for that, that period of time pre uh, co-founding R&B with, with my dad um, you know nobody in our business has worked for a whiskey company before well that's funny just kind of okay, let yeah, that sit okay. for a second yeah okay <laughs> Pause. Pause. Okay. <laughs> and you know, we we actually pride ourselves on that. We've we've um, you know we we like to think we've we're, we're carving our own path and our yeah. own direction. And I think a lot of that comes from you know the the sort of blank sheet of paper approach that we've taken yeah. to making whiskey. And I mean everything from where the distillery is to how we make it to how we sell it and so on is I think. Uh, we, we'd like to think kind of we were thinking with an open mind. Mm. So the, the question that, I, that I'm trying to get to is you create this, this product called While We Wait, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which I think is 
super smart. No one has really done something like that. The, the true question that I have for you is once you've created this product while we wait, did you feel as if that confined you a bit? In that you said, okay, guys, this is, this is what we're going to taste like. And now did you feel as if, shit, we've got to do this, and if we don't, it could present issues? Like, ha- no, I so guess, we, did While We Wait lead that direction, or did you veer from there in so any we, way? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll kind of scroll back to where, where I was. Apologies for losing my, my train of thought. No worries. But, We're two uh, years in, like you said. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we none of us have ever worked in the industry before, so While We Wait was really a way for us to learn yeah uh, learn about whiskey learn about the market um, yep. learn how to make it learn how to sell it learn how to yeah. talk about it and um, and so we created that in 2015 for exactly that reason um, and in terms of the flavor profile of that whiskey we knew before we built the distillery on Rassi yeah what flavor profile we wanted from the single malt so oh, okay. we have created what we would kind of internally define as a Hebridean style of single malt. And, yep. you know, what we mean by that is for us, that's a lightly peated single malt mm-hmm. um, with dark fruit characteristics. And dark fruit characteristics come from um, Alistair wanted to bring back a kind of a bit of a lost uh, flavor profile from the islands. Oh, um, okay. which had those sorts of characteristics in, in the whiskey. Yeah. And so we knew that our flavor profile for our core style mm. was going to be lightly peated with rich dark fruit flavors. And actually everything was then designed backwards from there. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. you know, we didn't kind of create while we wait and then think, oh, shit, we're not going to make a whiskey that tastes like that. <laughs> Yeah. We actually knew that the spirit and the, the, the core style we wanted to release from Rassi was lightly peated yeah. with rich dark fruits. Yep. And then we designed everything from the wood program to the spirit style to the design of the process to suit that flavor profile. Sure. Okay. And then that meant that when we were putting together While We Wait, which, as I said, was, was because we wanted to learn about whiskey... We, we knew that we wanted it to be that, that flavor profile. So mm-hmm. really, while we wait, it was born out of what we wanted the Rassi gotcha. single malt to taste like, oh, okay. rather than the other way around. Yeah. And, yeah. So just curious, you'd mentioned Alistair wanted to bring back this dark, fruity characteristics from a Hebridean distillery, something that had been lost. I had heard somewhere years ago that the traditional cask for maturing scotch whiskey was claret wine mm-hmm. is, is, that, is there a connection to that or was there another type of cask that, that Alistair was targeting um, so it was so the red wine casks are definitely a you know, big part of our production Yeah, um, and I, I'm not aware of the specific story you're talking about okay. in terms of claret wine but that would potentially make sense I know Alistair spent a lot of time um, looking at old Bowmore's Oh, and the yeah. kind of dark fruit elements that some yeah. of those, the good ones, yeah. uh, used to have. Uh, <laughs> not the not the perfumey, uh, oh, infamous ones. You're, 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 those are fighting words. <laughs> Jason and I are massive FWP fanatics. We love our perfumed Beaumore. Okay, right. So I'm just well, saying tread lightly, William. Yeah, That's all so I'm saying. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try my best. <laughs> I, yeah, so, yeah, so Alistair was was a fan of those types of those kind of old Bowmores and yeah. um, they were a little bit of an inspiration for the style of whiskey oh, like um, that. that we yeah. are producing from Rassi. That's um, brilliant. That naturally so where the fruit is not just coming from the cask but it's spirit driven fruit. Yeah, exactly. That's something yeah. which again we we talk about red wine casks quite a lot in our um in our wood program but also we have a dark fruit characteristic coming from our new make as well yeah um, so we have long fermentation times okay up to five days um, and what wow. that brings is you know kind of a 
black currant, dark fruit characteristic oh, okay. in the whiskey. And that, that's, again, something that we were looking for in the design of the distillery yeah. was a kind of fruity new make, but specifically those dark fruits. Interesting. Um, and then we wanted to kind of amplify that and bring that out further with the use of the red wine casks in our, yeah. in our um, cask so, policy. So let's back up a little bit on that, that sort of fruit, dark fruit driven spirit note. I guess I have sort of a two-part question for you. A, do you think that's a yeast-driven note? And B, do you think it's a maybe a more barley-driven note? And then B, too, is, if I remember correctly, you are using exclusively Scottish barley, which is which is quite unique. So does how does all of that play into that that dark fruit note that comes through in your new make? So we, um, so Rassi is a very uh, unique water source, um, and it's got one of the most diverse geologies in the UK. Oh, okay. In fact, and, and this is inspiration for some of our design work, which you which you know on the bottle yep. and so on. But the Gorgeous bottle, yep. the geology on Rassi is extremely diverse. Um, you know, university students go there for field trips, all that oh, okay. kind of stuff. Um, and the water is therefore high in mineral ri- mineral content, specifically manganese. And manganese uh, helps with the yeast development and fermentation uh, and brings out those kind of dark fruit characteristics. Uh, so man. I guess to yeah. answer your question, we would see it as coming from two areas. Yeah. Uh, one, the fermentation, so the yeast development sure. in, in the fermentation, and the other out of the red wine cast. So... Yeah. While we definitely are, you know, experimenting in, with different varieties of barley and different yeah. kind of uh, sort of regionality of barley yeah. growth, um, the dark fruit characteristic in particular we see is coming out the fermentation wow. and also the, the, the cask policy that we've got. That's wild. It's, water is this often overlooked... You, you, you've got a product that's made of three ingredients. Four, if you consider thyme and wood an ingredient, which I, which I do. But we talk about barley. Everybody wants to know, ooh, what barley type are you using? And, and I get that. Or nowadays, more people are interested in, in different yeast types. Here in the U.S., we're using, there's proprietary yeast varietals, and you've got distilleries like Kilhoman that are using two different yeast varieties and so on. Yeah. But we don't typically talk about water. And as you were mentioning that, I'm reminded that you also bottle on site. Yeah. Which means you're diluting your spirit with rase water. Yeah. So that's unusual that a distillery is diluting with the water that they use for production. Exactly. So for us, look, there's great debate, right, yeah. about the, the influence of water yeah. and I think also great skepticism yeah. uh, about the influence of water on the, the flavor profile of of a whiskey. And for us, the important bit is not, you know, where the skeptic- skepticism comes from is, you know, the distillation part of it, Yeah. Um, where, you know, there's different schools of thought, but, you know, some people say, okay, all the flavor is distilled out and the water's got nothing to do with yeah. it. Where water is important for us is post distillation. Yeah. So we do all distillation, all maturation, and all bottling mm. on the island. Mm-hmm. And what that means is we are diluting from, uh, you know, roughly about seventy percent ABV when when the spirit comes off the still down okay. to sixty three point five percent. Yeah. Is our is our regular cast filling strength yeah. anyway? We are using Rassi water to perform that piece of dilution yeah um, and then several years later when we come to bottling we're also using the same source water wow. to dilute down from whatever the natural cast strength is to huh. what our chosen bottling strength is so it, it, you know it could be valid to say okay the water is not so important if it's only distillation that mm. you're doing at mm-hmm. the location but for us doing everything on site is super important for several reasons, but one of is uh, because it allows us to use the source water at 
both stages of dilution yeah. into the cask yeah. and then several years later into the bottle as well. So, you know, huh. kind of 50 odd percent of the bottle is source water. I say water. Really. Right. And like hearing all of this makes me understand a bit more why, why Dave Broom in his most recent book, A Sense of Place, kind of focused on Raze. Mm-hmm. It's Raze water to distill, Raze water to dilute, bottling on site, Scottish barley. Your, the bottle itself is molded from, from fossils found mm-hmm. on site. It's, it's, really, it's really sort of a, a special, unique thing that you're describing to us. Yeah, absolutely. The, the provenance of, of the island is yeah. something which is really what we're all about yeah um you know and it's it's everything from you know doing everything on site allows us to really say yeah this is our assay whiskey right yeah. you know yeah and but more so than that it allows us to you know kind of control quality and be be in control of all parts of sure. production you know we're not outsourcing warehousing and sending the casts elsewhere we're not outsourcing bottling and so on but probably more importantly is providing uh, jobs to the to the local mm. micro economy. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, which is which is a key part to to what we're doing as well. And so, for us, the island and the provenance of the whiskey is so key at every mm. stage, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's what the the bottle's all about. You know, yeah, okay, it's a nice looking bottle, but really, yeah. what the point of it is is to encapsulate the place where the whiskey is made. Yeah, and uh, you know, we we went out with modelling clay and molded different yeah. rock and fossil formations on, on the island and they were 3D scanned and created into a CAD model and made into glass so it literally is every single indent of that is reflecting Rassi, it's a real piece of Rassi and so you know as much as possible we're, we're, yeah. we're bringing that island provenance through in the, in the whiskey I love it what was bringing people to Rasse before the distillery like I mean you, you have a dedicated ferry the the island is is obviously gorgeous, but what was bringing people to the dis, to the island before the distillery was there? Because you had the the hotel, right? So it makes yeah, sense there was, there was travel there. Yeah, so there there, there was some you know uh, there's definitely some activity in Rassi. Don't get me wrong; it wasn't as if there was yeah. nothing going on there before <laughs> there was the distillery. In fact, Rassi House is the hotel just down the road from us. is an outdoor center, uh, okay. and so. Uh, lots of schools from particularly from Glasgow would spend uh, time there in the summer and kayaking and oh, all okay. that kind of stuff so a lot of people who went to school in Glasgow if you speak to them yeah. they'll have heard of Rassi from yeah. from going on outdoor or outward bound it's like kind field of, trip kind yeah, of things exactly, yeah exactly okay. field trip yeah, yeah. Things, summer okay. field trips which so that, so that was something which has been happening for, for okay. decades okay um, and then in terms of Tourism, that's probably the the main thing that the distilleries mm. brought to, to Rassi a wee bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, Sky is Sky, it's one of the most famous parts of Scotland. Yeah. It was of the world, you know, I'd argue. It's yeah. it's Sky. I mean yeah. Exactly. Sorry, and, yeah. You know, I, I would say perhaps Rassi was maybe overlooked a little bit okay. by by yeah. people who, who would who would travel to, to Sky and to some of the other Western Isles. Um, and I think what the distillery has done is brought, um, yeah, more a little bit more tourism to, to the island specifically, mm. rather than just the area where there, where there yeah. always was, yeah. uh, or not always, but you know where there recently has been yep. quite a lot of tourism. So, um, you know what what was happening on Rassi before? Um, there's you know a, a lot of crofting mm-hmm. on the island. There's Rassi House, which is a hotel and an outdoor centre for mm-hmm. for for kids um, and uh, yeah but other than that there was no probably no um, commercial or, or kind of larger commercial business certainly no exporting as well yeah, you sure. know to now have a product from Rassi exported to 35 plus countries is quite wild something <laughs> I think so yeah is that a sense of pride for the for the locals I think for everyone involved yeah. To be honest, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really. Yeah. I think it, from what you know, I think maybe ten years ago it would have been a bit unimaginable to think, okay, we're going to create a, a a single malt 
you know, on, on and from this island and then that's going to now be available mm. in Brooklyn where we're where we're sitting right now. Yeah. So <laughs> you know that's kinda I think for a lot of um yeah. the, the locals in Rassi that would have been a something that didn't seem like it would happen. It's never in their yeah, purview, yeah, yeah. Of course, and so yeah. I think for everyone involved, myself included, and, and others in our team, it's it, it, it has been a real source of pride over the last. Yeah. Uh, how long has it been? Well, certainly eight years since Alistair and my dad came yeah, together to go. build the place, and and wow. uh, you know various yeah. number for others involved. So. So, so you've got a few very unique things going on. You're distilling in an island that is not traditional for distilling. You're, you're using your local water for every bit of the process where water is needed. You're bottling on site, very unusual. Using exclusively Scottish barley, very unusual. You're Scottish-owned, which is increasingly more unusual these days. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but, <laughs> but I am curious to go down the rabbit hole of... Of your of your recipe for your signature single malt, and is, it was interesting. You did a training for the Impex team yeah. last week, and you started going over your recipe. And you said, "Well, you know, we do the we do the chinkapin, we do the Bordeaux, and we do the rye. And this is why we do rye rather than bourbon." It hadn't even occurred to me that sherry wasn't in that recipe. Yeah. I don't know why, but it, but it hadn't. <laughs> So, but you have a very unusual recipe, not just in casks, but in spirit as well. Um, and so I wonder if you could tell us about, about your recipe and how that came about. Yeah, so, so when, we, um, when we decided to, to build the distillery on Rassi, as I said, we knew the flavor profile that we were looking for, yeah. and we worked back from there. There was another thing that we knew, yeah. that we would be selling three, four, five six-year-old whiskey um, sure. and like to be completely blunt and short we couldn't afford to not do that <laughs> makes sense yeah because so you didn't lead with vodka or gin or anything yeah, like that yeah was... we, and we can come on to the gin which actually was something which came after our whiskey yeah. quite uh, counterintuitively <laughs> to, to most but uh, but yeah in terms of creating the Isla Rassi single malt we knew that we would be selling young whiskey um, you know, we are, as I said, a family-owned business. We're, we're small. Yeah. There's no way that we could have sat on our hands for, whatever, 10, 12-plus years and sort yeah. of watched the clock tick. So um, we uh, we knew we would be selling young whiskey, and we quite, uh, you know, I think we, we quite rightly wanted to sell the best young whiskey we possibly could. And so yeah. when we were thinking to ourselves, hey, you know, we're going to be selling three, four, five-year-old whiskey, how do we ensure that that whiskey has complexity, depth, yeah. balance of flavor at that relatively young age. Yeah. Um, and so when we were tasked with that, with that challenge, um, Alistair spent a good kind of 12 to 18 months mm. uh, working with, um, with a, a friend of ours, a, a consultant, um, his name's Henrik, uh, from Spirit of Heaven, if I'm going to pronounce oh, that correctly. Yeah, of course. Oh, with the, like <laughs> the test tube kind of, yeah, or the beaker bottles, style the kind of beaker bottles. Style bottles. Yeah, oh, and I it, remember seeing some of your whiskeys maturing in those casks as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we yeah. we wanted to to build a whiskey that had complexity, balance, yeah. depth of flavor at a relatively young age, and yeah. um, with through working with Henrik and also yeah. due to Alistair's background in blending which is essentially taking different flavor profiles yeah. and blending them together to produce a harmonious style of whiskey, a mm. harmonious uh, kind of flavor. Um, we developed this unique recipe, which brings together different flavor elements by combining different spirit types with different cast types mm. and bringing on uh, complexity um, probably quicker than you otherwise might if you were to say mature one spirit type in one cast type yeah sure, uh, sure you know sure. Um, which yep. which a lot of the more traditional distilleries uh, uh, do so it's something which was developed through don't want to say necessity <laughs> but if we you know we knew that we were going to be selling didn't they say don't they say necessity is the mother of invention e exactly so, exactly so yeah. 
Um, yeah, it was something born, born out of probably necessity. And yeah. we said to ourselves, look, we want to make sure it's as, as good as it can possibly be at that young age. And so we developed this unique recipe, which we call our Nashia recipe. It means mm-hmm. the six in Gaelic. And what that is, is it's two spirit types. So heavily peated spirit and unpeated spirit mm-hmm. that, that we produce about 50-50 through the year. Heavily to what PPM? So the barley comes in at 48 to 52. Okay. But we take a relatively narrow cut on the stills. So the phenols that end up in the casks and then subsequently the bottles are you know relatively low compared Much to lower. 48 okay. to 52. All right. but, the, but the barley comes in at what would be industry standards heavily peated. Or, gotcha. Um, okay. And so... We produce those two spirit types through the year, and they're then matured separately in three cast types. X-Rye casks, mm. virgin chinkapin oak casks, mm-hmm. chinkapin, for those who don't know, being a species of oak, and ex-Bordeaux red wine casks. Yeah. Those two spirit types and three cast types are brought together to produce huh. our core style, lightly peated with rich dark fruit flavors. And so the, the uniqueness of that recipe, the unique cast composition that we create our single malt out of was born through wanting to create the best young whiskey we could yeah um and uh and 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 that's yeah that's what we set about doing um and it's something which you know the the next natural question is well what about your older whiskey and and aging that on and that's where we Mm. now that we're emptying casks the refills are what we will be kind of laying down for future and older expressions. For older, yeah, yeah, exactly. Not for your three, four, five year old, but yeah. for your eight, 12, 15 exactly. year old. Exactly. Okay. If, if we go down that route. Yeah. So th- that wasn't my next logical question, but I'm not a very <laughs> logical person. The logical question that I had in my head was, and maybe the answer is quite obvious. But the question that I had was, why not ex bourbon and ex sherry? If that's, I mean, I think I think a lot of people use ex bourbon and ex sherry because a ex bourbon casks are quite ubiquitous. They're they're they tend to be slightly easier to access. Ex sherry is just incredibly familiar from a flavor standpoint. So you've avoided the most ubiquitous cask, as well as the most. Uh, familiar cask to people, especially when it comes to the darker whiskeys. So why why dodge those for these three? Yeah, so a few reasons. One is to to develop flavor um, and complexity at a relatively young age. Yeah. Two is, you know, we pride ourselves on having quite a distinctive flavor profile. You know, yeah. when people ask me, oh, what does Rassi taste like? Like, yeah. you know, what's a distillery is similar to? I, I, yeah. I actually don't have a great answer to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to say, you know, a, a Rassi tastes a Rassi. Yeah. Um, and we, we wanted to create something distinctive, something unique, something that's identifiable to, to us. And yeah. so, you know, if we were to go down the route that many others have and the, the more traditional cast types that are used in whiskey, you know, we don't <laughs> think we would... Um, uh, you know, really have a flavor profile that was kind of unique and ownable mm. and something that, that, that really was true to us. Yeah. Um, and the third reason is that flavor profile we were looking for, lightly peated with rich, dark fruits. Yeah. Um, the, the, the lightly peated element could, could obviously could come from the spirit. Sure. But that, that fruity element is something which... And, and dark fruits specifically, yeah. Um, you know, cause cherry can often be associated with dried fruits, things like that. Sure, but, but exactly. Those yeah. kind of cherries, those black currants, yeah, are uncommon in whiskey. Yep. And that's something which you know led us to the wine casks and and so on. So, you know, it's it's really, yeah, those those three main reasons: the complexity, balance, depth, yeah. the flavor at a young age. You know, creating a distinctive whiskey that was unique and identifiable to mm. to us and creating a whiskey of that style that we aspire to, to, to make, which is the lightly peated okay. with rich dark fruit flavors. There's something that I find quite special about your ex-Bordeaux casks. When, when we were at the distillery last September 2022, 2022, we tasted through a number of casks, and you had taken us through, you know, here's peated rye, here's unpeated rye, here's peated chinkapin, here's unpeated chinkapin, and so on. And then when we got to the 
peated and unpeated Bordeaux, the thing that struck me instantly was that it didn't taste of wine, but it, like you had said, it was the cherries, it was the black mm-hmm. currants, it was the the coffee grounds from yesterday. Like yeah. it was, it didn't taste like dirty sock wine. Rather, it tasted like all the fruit that you would get, yeah. the notes that you would get that you talk about. Meanwhile, underlying is the dirty socks from, like, none of yeah. that was there. So how are you achieving, or if you know, how are you achieving the fruit without the whininess? Mm-hmm. So one thing with the wine cast, or a couple things, actually, that, that are important to us, um, and this is true, actually, of all the the, the core recipe casts, so the rye, the chinkapin, and the red wine, they're all full-term maturation. Oh, okay. So, and with the wine casks, what that means is, so that maybe that kind of um, undesirable flavor profile is perhaps been driven by wine finishes mm-hmm. and whiskey. Yeah. Whiskey spending a brief amount of time in a in a wine cask, you know, six uh. months, nine months. All of our red wine uh, matured spirit and matured whiskey is full term maturation, so it's had at least three years fully maturing in a red wine cask and what that means and what that gives us is initially and and you should see you know six months into to new make being in the wine cask it literally looks like rosé wine it's like uh, (laughs) it's like blush kind of pink right yeah rosé all day yeah (laughs) yeah and and you know that that is the the spirit taking on the influence from the red wine very quickly because that's what's uh you know kind of on the on the outside of the oak inside the cask if that makes sense sure yeah um, and then <laughs> but as the as time goes on the spirit starts to get past the red wine and into the oak uh, and you actually see the flavor profile um, of the whiskey change from that kind of quite overly whiny mm-hmm. um, you know kind of flavor profile that I think has given sometimes red wine cask a bit of a yeah, I guess a bit of a mixed uh, reception. Yeah, just, yeah. Um, yeah but, not a good reputation sometimes. Yeah, yeah. as it starts to yeah. mature, uh, you know, longer than maybe a year, two years, you, the spirit starts to go into the oak. Yeah. And that's when you start to get influence from both the red wine and the oak. Oh, so okay. For us, we are, you know, we... Uh, believe that we're that we're getting that balance of flavor in the red wine cast because of the full term maturation and because we're allowing it to allowing the spirit time yeah. to get into the oak uh, you know beyond beyond the red wine and bring on flavors from both the both the Bordeaux red wine but also mm. the Quercus Petre and Quercus Robert oak that's 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 in the oh, you know, okay the cask in the red ra- okay of, gotcha yeah. um, that and the second piece is these are completely wet red wine casks so they're not str they're not treated or, or anything like that so oh, okay. we bring them over from france directly from uh, the vineyards uh, completely kind of what yep. you would call wet so so yep. not not treated at all um yeah or, we won't mention the vineyards casks. here but for our bordeaux drinkers they're they're sought after red wines right yeah yeah we yeah we, fo- we focus on uh, quality for that way yeah there you go <laughs> yeah which is which is brilliant and it, and it's and it's smart you know I think the first red wine whiskey that I had that floored me that that, that helped change my mind and then I had a shit ton that like unchanged my mind but it was um, Glen Morangy in a X Margot cask right yeah and it was it was all of the stone fruits of Glen Morangy, but then all of those deep dark fruits that came through in the Margot cast that they did, and it, and it and it just showed me that okay, whiskey can be matured in a red wine cask, and it can be incredibly special. And then I remember, like I said, then I had a ton that sort of started to, to prove otherwise. But then when we were at the distillery, and I'm tasting through these casks time and time again it was the red bordeaux casks mm-hmm. that that i found myself drawn to yeah despite me normally unique. trying to stay away from it so yeah yeah, yeah uh, completely unique and it's something that, that we've spent <clears throat> had spent quite a lot of time talking to people about and 
and maybe maybe kind of working through some of those preconceptions yeah. about, about red wine casks. Um, uh, and you know, I, I would say the, I mean, yeah, a hugely unique flavor profile and something which is extremely yeah. important again to our overall, uh, you know, kind of core style of whiskey that w- that we're creating. Yeah. So started distilling in 2017. Yeah, I think it was the 19th of September from from memory. Oh, that's um, my that's my so daughter's birthday, the oh, 19th wow. of September. Oh wow! Well. Oh we do man! A special yeah. Or two. <laughs> so here you go. So 19th of September 2017. Yeah. So your whiskey became, or your spirit became of age, the 20th of September 2020. Yeah. Right during COVID. Yeah. How did that look for launching a brand? <laughs> <laughs> uh, frightening. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. We, um, yeah. We launched our, what we called our inaugural release in November 2020. Okay. Um, so, uh, and <laughs> yeah, it was, a, <laughs> it was a bizarre period of time. Um, strangely enough for... I was, I mean, it was a small batch release anyway, and and we were we were kind of, you know, I don't think it's necessarily any sort of sign of any kind of yeah. thing for you to sell your first release. I think <laughs> it's just, I think it seem it seems to just happen yeah. with lots of distilleries. So, you know, we we were always planning to release in that November period of time, mm-hmm. um, you know, whiskey season and so on, um, and we released it. Um, predominantly, well, we released it online in the UK and then we released it via our our distributors at the time uh, internationally, and it was it was a weird one because on paper it would have been a really challenging time to launch a mm. single malt um, brand and so on, and it was from a lot of perspectives, like um, kind of logistical perspectives and operational perspectives. Yeah, but from um, a sort of awareness. And I guess a sort of demand perspective. Actually, it was strangely favourable because yeah. there was there weren't many distractions apart from people, <laughs> and particularly whiskey fans, yeah. sitting on their computers finding whiskeys to buy. <laughs> and so that's a good point. Yeah. Strangely enough, for us, you know, we were we were we were unknown, right? And we, you know, we're still a very small brand, um, and. You know, for us at the time, it was a bit of a captive audience because mm. you had a bit of a fever going on in whiskey, yeah, sure. for better, for worse, and for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> um, but uh-huh. uh, you know, strangely enough, it was a bit of a captive audience to you know to launch the the yeah. first release into. So, I actually think from 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 a, a brand awareness or demand perspective, it was actually an okay time, all things yeah. considered. Ba- balanced with the fact that it was a shit show logistically and op- operationally yeah. because of restrictions yeah. and and, uh, and you know absence of workers and, and I mean our kind of freight forwarders and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the whole thing was a, mm. a shit show. Speaking so. of logistics, I was thinking about this earlier. I forgot the question, then it came back. You know, I was thinking about just getting onto and off of Raze. Yeah, <laughs> like are you? You're tied to that one ferry going back and forth. We are, we are. Um, on the one hand, and as I was talking about before, doing as much as we can on the island is yeah. clearly super important to yeah. us. On the other hand, it can be a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, and yeah, we we everything has to go on and off via the the ferry. Yeah. So when it's when it's a bit windy in January or. February and and in fact we've had ferries cancelled around Christmas time, which is yeah. not great for trying to get people shipments and so on. Sure, um, but uh, but yeah, we're we are yeah you, you're you're kind of limited a wee bit with you know from a logistical perspective. Um, that said, the the Sky Bridge is helpful. <laughs> um, oh yeah, you know, at, the, you at the very least, the yeah. ferry is only twenty five minutes. Yeah. Um, it's not the same as an Isla ferry or, or no. some of the outer Hebrides. <laughs> and so yeah. if the ferry is running, yeah. we're actually reasonably well connected, all things considered, because okay. you're then on a road on Sky. Yeah. You've got the Sky Bridge onto the mainland and, and you're kind of You're, kinda you're home free from there. Yeah. So, sort of. yeah. Um, so yeah, so the, the, there's been challenges. Um uh, but we're, we're we're working through them. I think one of the more challenging areas logistically is has been 
less uh, large chunks of kind of pallets and things like that moving on and off Rassi, but more mm -hmm. your kind of smaller couriered orders to small and independent retail in the UK. That's been uh. difficult because you've got limited choice of couriers on Rassi. In fact, there's only one that you can choose from. Uh, all right. You know, it's expensive uh, and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're trying to find different ways to get cases to our... Um, our retailers in the UK. You need a robust so drone system. I mean, we need I a think lot that's of things. what you need, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just, uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to add, well, I've got a, f a couple more things for you here. And then I, I realize we, we have a meeting that we need to get to. So so I'm, I'm cognizant of time here. But you know, one of the things that I found quite special in visiting was you have accommodations connected to the distillery, a really gorgeous, I don't know, do you call it a hotel? It's, I know it's called Boredale House. Yeah, we, yeah. we call it Boredale House. Um, and it's, yeah, it's our distillery uh, accommodation. Yeah. And um, I, I think hotel is maybe a bit of a stretch. Uh, you know, it's a small... Um, yeah, six six double bedrooms, lovely rooms, and we've just recently introduced a restaurant and a bar. Yes, um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's we 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 call the the whole kind of visitor experience yeah. Boredale House, which is more homely than calling it, I guess, a hotel or, or accommodation. <laughs> it's really it's part yeah. of our uh, part of our whole distillery. It's it's kind of our customers. Uh, place to chill out okay. um, and so that's something we decided to do um, quite early on mm. the, the old Victorian house uh, Boredale house was, was always part of the hotel on Rassi and we decided to keep the original house and you know we for a couple reasons one we there's limited accommodation as it is on, mm -hmm. on Rassi and the surrounding area so as we encouraged visitors to come we obviously wanted somewhere for them to put their heads down at night yeah um, and also in terms of just getting people more connected to what we're doing and spending more time with our team and our um, kind of products and things like that is, is a really mm. important part of our um, business so you know we there was a practical element and then there's also um, you know a, a kind of um, an element of trying to engage more with our customers and have more of a yeah. more of a kind of human relationship beyond yeah. just oh yeah we're a bottle on a shelf in a in a, yeah. in a liquor store actual we're human connectivity a place where yeah. you can chill out and yeah. like have a laugh with our team and yeah. uh, eat some food that's you know cooked from local produce and yep. drink our whiskeys and gin of course and yeah enjoy those and but but really just have a nice time um, yeah. and uh, you know that's where the the accommodation angle was was born out of yeah um and it's, it's going extremely well um we chloe who's who's my colleague who manages the whole Bordale house is uh, like awesome <laughs> <laughs> and uh we couldn't uh -huh. live without her and yeah. um she's really kind of amped up the 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 quality of the experience as well okay over the past sort of year or so so yeah we're we're, we're enjoying seeing people enjoy it uh, as I love they it. come to visit yeah. yeah yeah the restaurant was phenomenal the I don't think you are are you Michelin star not yet because because <laughs> man if no, you're not, not I, you're, you, you, you wouldn't know you weren't let's let's put it that way <laughs> I thought it was the way you know part of the way we talk about Michelin star restaurants is what's your difference between fine dining and a Michelin star and it's just that extra 5% of looking after the customer, making sure things are plated at the same time like just very tiny little things and you were nailing it every time when, when we were there and so, yeah, it was just it was a really special stay it really yeah. was yeah. yeah, there's fair, you know, it's a new thing for us it's, and it's the, I mean the the food element and uh, yeah we're, we're we're working on developing it all and but I think so far and this is the most important thing our our guests and our visitors and customers are yeah are enjoying it and, and we're getting great feedback so yeah you know doing doing more of what they love is kind of yeah. what we what what we're here for yeah beauty 
All right, I got two last things for you. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about you doing things in reverse. You open a distillery, you produce a bunch of spirit that you can't sell for three years in a day, <laughs> and then as you start releasing your whiskeys, people are saying, yeah, but where's your gin? Yeah, we, yeah. Uh... <laughs> and then you say, oh, fuck, maybe we should make a gin. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were a bit, a, a bit kind of stubborn is the wrong word, but we were definitely, and we probably are, whiskey first, yeah. right, in our DNA. And yeah. um, just the way that the, uh, the 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 company came to be, you know, Alistair's background, um, or, you know, just the the spirit we first produced was, yeah, was whiskey, yeah. and that's that's definitely our our DNA. But uh, you know, as we as we progressed as a destination, and people came to the distillery and, and all that, um, you know, every second customer was asking us, "Oh yeah, where's your gin? Can can I try your gin? Can <laughs> you know?" And, and uh, I think we got a wee bit sick and tired of saying we don't do gin. That we that we decided to to listen to our yeah. customers, um, which which is no bad thing to do. It's not a bad thing. And uh, <laughs> and and create a gin. So we we first launched the Isla Rassi gin in July 2019. Okay. Which is when you think about it, almost two years after our first um, malt spirit ran off yeah. ran off the stills. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and that was initially just for the distillery shop and for our website. But again, people then enjoyed it. They liked it. Oh, mm. I'm from so and so place. I'm from here in Germany, or I'm from there yeah. in you know south of England. Where where can I buy it? So yeah. we then uh, kind of opened up the distribution of the gin, um, and uh, and I guess the rest is a short history. <laughs> but it but it's a, a slightly unusual gin in that you're using some of your local botanicals. One being rhubarb, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so the, the key botanicals are juniper, of course. Yeah. And we we put a small amount, uh, or what we can, of, of rassy juniper into the uh, production. Uh, there's not enough to do the whole production sure. from, yeah. from the island, but we put, put what we can in. Um, also lemon and orange, which... Sadly, not native to Rassi. The climate is not quite <laughs> there yet. Okay. Um, but yet. It's, uh, I like the use of the word yet. Well, slightly depressing. But, <laughs> um, but uh, we, um, yeah, lemon and orange peel, um, which is just a key flavor profile we're looking for. It's quite a citrus legend. And then rhubarb as well. And what inspired the use of a rhubarb was wild rhubarb was growing at the hotel when we when we bought the uh, place okay. and so that inspired yeah. the, the use of of rhubarb in the overall gin recipe yeah um and then we actually have a final uh, I'm, I'm i'm quote unquoting with my hands here but yeah. uh, <laughs> Air quotes. Have, uh, yeah. secret botanical that's not so secret which is actually our rassi malt spirit and um, okay. so we have some of our new make unpeated of course yeah and uh, new make in the in the gin as well so I like to say it's a whiskey lover's gin. Yeah. Uh, because of that. So it's it's enough to be detectable. You yeah, get some of the, it gives the it, dark I, fruits I, coming I, from that? I feel it gives a bit yeah. of of course the fruitiness, but it gives a mouth feel to our ah, gin that that okay. I that I think is quite unique. Yeah. And um, because you've got that slightly more kinda sort of viscous malt spirit mm, in there, mm. it just gives the, the, the gin quite a sort of well rounded mouthfeel that, that I think is uh, unique to, to, gotcha. to our gin yeah. gotcha well I can personally vouch for its deliciousness I like it quite a lot and I'm not a I'm not a gin drinker yeah, so whiskey um, drinkers so whiskey gin. drinkers gin <laughs> um, so listen I realize we, we, we have a schedule we have a, an appointment that we need to get to so I'm going to leave you with one thing after I ask you this question what does the next five years look like for you? What What is driving you and the rest of the team at Raze for the next five years? What are you looking forward to? So <clears throat> a couple of things. I mean, we, we really want, with the Isla Rassi distillery, you know, we would, we would love to kind of, you know, build a super high quality, respected um, yeah. sort of, single malt from mm. an island that has never had that type of product and really you know build something that's going to put Rassi on the map yeah. and 
benefit the local and wider area um, and you know be build and create the, the, the best single malt we possibly can from that island and mm-hmm. we are that's what we're trying to focus on for the next five years our you know telling our core story around the world hopefully having people enjoy that and, and you know uh, drink the whiskey and, and, and have a good time around it and yeah. and uh, bring bring the island to to the to the world so you know that's our kind of I guess quite simple five year ambition with Rassi yeah. is build a kind of iconic new iconic island single malt that will do do the island proud yep and more more broadly than that for um, our team we ha- are building a second distillery in mm. Campbelltown um, and uh, the whole kind of thinking behind that I mean we we like to we like to challenge ourselves <laughs> I guess <laughs> um, uh-huh. and we are you know we're an, an ambitious group of people that want to um, yeah kind of create a, a long term sustainable business and so um, you know we um, wanted to add a second distillery um, and we wanted to add a complementary style of single malt from a complementary region in Scotland but that also has similar USPs in terms of provenance yeah. quality um, and uh, kind of independence sure. and so we've yeah we, we purchased a farm down in Campbelltown okay. and we're going to build a, 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 a fully sustainable farm to bottle distillery down there okay. um, where we'll grow our own barley on site uh, a portion of production will be completely farm to bottle okay. we'll be trying to use local barley for the for the rest of the production but um, yeah we really want to bring our I guess we like to think we take a bit of a contemporary or dare I say it like innovative approach to, to creating mm-hmm. single malt mm-hmm. and we want to bring that same approach to uh, Campbelltown as well and and create a yeah. contemporary Campbelltown single malt that's going to still you know take some elements of tradition from the style of whiskey that the that the region is is known for but add our own kind of um i guess twist to it and our own okay. interpretation of it so yeah a bit of a long answer but next yeah next five years is really you know focusing on building the the, the rassi single malt into something that we can all be proud of yeah and uh, and um progress our nascent uh, contemporary campbelltown <laughs> single malt plans <laughs> so wait a second so if if you were R&B distillers, Rasse and Border, are you going to be now <laughs> R&C and B? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we still have plans to do yeah. something in the borders. In the borders, you do. Essentially, you know, Rasse and what will be called the Macrahanish uh, Distillery will be two single malt oh, um, by the distilleries. Golf course. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, out okay. next to the farms yeah. next to the airport. Yep. So there'll be two single malt distilleries producing two distinctly different styles of whiskey Mm -hmm. and then we do have plans to build a a smaller distillery in uh, Coldstream which will be uh, for one of a better words lots of things that are not single malt so think of mash bills Uh, pot still distilled mash bill whiskies uh, different grains uh, etc so um, I like the sound of that maybe that's a kind of exciting place to to, uh, alright to wrap things up oh beauty well thank you oh the thing that I was going to leave you with and I'm not blowing smoke and I'm and I'm taking my impacts hat off I truly think what you guys are doing is is phenomenal I feel as if without the impacts hat on Raze is a is a brand that I shout to the rooftops because I feel you guys are doing something not just the right way but something that's different and offers new flavors and something just something new to a drinker which is what whiskey drinkers want what's that new thing it's and there's so much to discover with you guys uh, so i just my hat's off to you I, I think what you're doing is quite excellent and i'm happy thank to you. shout it out everywhere thank you very much well i, I appreciate the kind words and uh yeah looking forward to that fourth beer there you go well <laughs> cheers to that cheers to that thank you joshua <laughs> thank you william Thank you. 
sincere thanks to William Dobby for his time there and, and sincere thanks to you, Joshua, for, for taking the time to sit down with them. I've been a fan of Rassi for a long time, since you and I first sat down with Ian Robertson at yeah. uh, Maltstock. Yeah, Maltstock, yeah, sure. Uh, a fair few years ago now. Mm-hmm. But I've I've really followed along closely watching Rassi, what's coming out there, the way they've married in, you know, the wine and the chinkapin and the peat. It's uh, it's really vital what they're doing there. And it, as you can maybe tell, it really excites me. Mm. I also, you know, in reading A Sense of Place by Dave Broom that we've talked about, and we've had Dave on talking about that as well, I thought he did a fantastic job in that book capturing yeah, the sure. essence of Rassi as well. So through your interview there, it's lovely hearing more about that, you know, that that elementary passion mm. that exists mm-hmm. at the distillery yeah. on Rassi. Yeah. It's really cool, really cool. I, if I have a regret, right. it's that I'm not tasting more Rassi. I know you've been very fortunate. Obviously, you're mm. you're part of Impex and you're bringing them in and you're tasting cast samples and you've been to the distillery. Like I, I, I genuinely feel envious of that. Mm. And and I know that when you were last there on the island, and you were texting me like, "Oh, I'm, we're tasting this right now. It's phenomenal!" <laughs> and oh, we just had this. It's phenomenal. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I had a little green-eyed monster there. I. I really wanted to share in that excitement as well. And and now here you are talking to William in person and I'm not a part of that conversation for obvious reasons, different directions, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Yeah. But but thank you for bringing it to the, to the podcast and thank you to William for his time. That was very cool. Yeah, it was my pleasure doing it. William is, he's, he's a passionate guy. He's young, he's enthusiastic. You know, you know as well as I do. You know, he's part of the family that owns the business. There, there's something to be said about speaking with someone who has an ownership stake in that business. You're having a different conversation. It's not just coming from, you know, we make a product and we sell it. Like, this is what they do. This is providing for families, right? This is them taking things from, you know, from the ground up, like it's a point of pride, you know, left, yeah. right, and center. And, and so, and that, and that I think yeah. it came through with, with the conversation with, with William. So, so yeah, again, you said it before, but I'll say it again, William, thank you so much. It was excellent spending the time with you. Yeah. And when you get some more of those super sexy samples from Impex, you know, you've got my address, you know, just... I tell you, I got. I'm not going to say it here because <laughs> because there are certain things I'm not allowed to say. Here's what I will say: When I was at the distillery last September with the mm-hmm. Impex team, and they took us into the warehouse, gorgeous warehouse. Sorry, Jason, <laughs> just rubbing it a little bit more. And uh, they tasted us through some single casks of a very mm-hmm. specific cask type that you don't see too often if mm-hmm. at all i can't remember when i've ever seen it anyway <laughs> we were flo- the entire team was like oh my god can you just bottle all of this that's mm-hmm. the next single cask that's coming to the u.s and it's it's oh wow yeah it's going to be a belter i'll make sure you get a bottle don't you Thank worry you. you will be very Thank happy you. yep to be, to be clear, Impex single cask and not single cask nation single cask. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Impex. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Listen, before we get on to not just not just an email that we have to read, but also we're going to be tasting, we've got four new samples from Blind Barrels, our, our good friend Christopher Sebastian, a.k.a. Seabass, <laughs> sent us these samples back in June, 
Oh, and, heck yeah. And, uh, and we're finally getting around to it. So we're going to be tasting through sample A in, in, in a little bit. But before we get to the email, before we get to the blind barrels, I want to just touch on news really quickly. And really, I, I want to thank people. So, you know, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, however time works, we let our U.S.-based uh, Single Cast Nation members know that we've got four new casks that, that we're about to bottle and bring into our warehouse. And our warehouse manager said, guys, you have to make room. There, there just simply isn't enough room for more whiskey. So we said, or actually you, Jason, said, you know what? Let's run a buy two, get one free sale. And I thought you were crazy for doing that. I do like free things. You do like free things. So anyway, you're my business partner. I've only said no to you once. Uh, and you honored that. And you no. live to regret it, and so I that's do. perfect. Uh, uh, but I said yes to this, and, and the, the nation members really rallied and came through and took advantage of those savings. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, gosh, I can, I can tell you right now, we, we sold out our French brandy. We sold out our M&H. We sold out our Black Button. We our sold Athrusk. out our Indiana. Yeah. We sold out our Athrusk. <laughs> like, now I'm worried that I'm putting together an incomplete Joshua Hatton list. But <laughs> yes, it's, if you go to our website right now, we have Copperworks. Mm -hmm. We have a little bit of Macmira and we have a little bit of the Good Ride bourbon. That's all we've got sitting on our website. Amazing. So yeah. However, so, yeah. Oh. However, we're not yeah. leaving it there. Yeah, we're not leaving it there. So, the four casks that we had to make room for are in no in no particular order. Uh, they're all American whiskeys. We've got three American single malts. We've got um, we've got a nine year old peated Westland from a Pinot de Chiron cask. We have a five year old Virginia Distillery Company from an STR cask. We have a six-year-old westward from a number two char, new charred oak cask, and there's a little bit of special malt in there, so it's got a bit of a chocolatey kind of note to it. And then finally, our bourbon, which is one that um, our, our dear Elijah picked quite mm -hmm. a while ago, uh, is a six-year-old from the Woodenville Distillery out of out of Washington State, and that is. Um, I think there's there's a reason LVMH bought Woodenville is because they're making mm. kick-ass bourbon that is just it's right. gonna floor you. I mean, I think all these are gonna floor you. For me, as 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 a bourbon drinker, I was surprised as to how well these the Woodenville folk make their whiskey. And I remember the, tasting them for the first time at Whiskey Jubilee in Seattle. And, and just being amazed that someone out of Washington State can make a bourbon like this remarkable. So Yeah, the, yeah. the, the Woodenville's what I've had in my glass, sipping away on that during the, yeah. the first half of today's episode and listening to the interview. So yeah. it's it's an easy, easy little sipper. Yep. Rather yep. delicious. For, for sure. So, yeah, yeah, four, four great casts getting bottled uh, the end of August. Should be for sale at some point in September. You know, join Single Cast Nation, become a member, pay attention to what's coming down the pipe. They are all single casks. They will be small outturns. Some people will get their bottles, some people won't. That's the very nature of single casks, but we are working on more. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so listen, Jason. Mm -hmm. we, we've... Shit, let, let's... You talking about drinking the Woodenville makes me want to drink a thing. So let's. I do have an empty glass in front of me. Let's read the email after we do okay. a blind barrel. I mean, Seabass has waited long enough. He's waited months. I can't, we can't make <laughs> him wait any longer. But I, but I will tell you, Seabass is a very good sport because he listened along to all of the Macbeth blind tasting <laughs> that we were doing and, and included Jess and, and Sweet Scott in, in one round of that as well. And he would text regularly and say how much he was enjoying it. So yes. he wasn't... He wasn't begging us to, to give up on the Macbeth tasting and jump over to the blind barrels. He is a he's a good lad in that regard. So I'm excited to get to his blind barrels tasting experience sample A today. 
So last time around, you were the person who did the reveal when it when it came to blind barrels, and then again, you were the person to do the reveal for all of the Macbeth bottlings. And so this time around, I wanted to take the driver's seat. I hope you don't mind. I hope our listeners don't mind. Um, but just just so everyone's aware, so the sample pack that we got just says six slash twenty two on it. So I don't know if this is from twenty twenty two or not. Perhaps, yeah. I know he wanted to send us an older one just so that it wouldn't ruin the surprise for other people. And we certainly would never want to ruin no. the surprise for anybody. And Seabass knows that we simply don't do research or homework, so we, we don't know what's what's in these. But here's here's what I'll tell you. Or actually, here's what I'll ask you, Jason. Uh-huh. Describe the color of this whiskey to me. <laughs> And 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 give me some descriptions of the nose. I just poured mine. And no, so, so some of the things I'm curious to hear, right? Like, what do you think the color is? What type of spirit do you think it is? If it's malt, do you think it's from Scotland? Do you think it's from India? Do you think it's from the U.S.? If it's if it's American, do you think it's bourbon? Do you think it's rye? Right, and so on. So, I would say it. The color is fresh motor oil. Oh, I like it's got that. that. It's also got an incredibly oily texture to it. As I'm turning it around in my glass, the legs are going high and, and thick around the edges yeah. and then very slowly dropping back down into the liquid. I, so it, yeah. Yeah, so right off the bat, it is a, a beautiful dram. It is very appealing to the eye. So here's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I have not looked I've not looked at this but nosing this it smells like a whiskey that I quite often tell people needs to be an everyday bottle on your shelf. Okay. And we've done those lists before, right? What are the yeah. five bottles? What are the 10 bottles that you need? So it smells like malt whiskey. I I get a bit of a a smoky, gentle, smoky quality going on, but I don't know if you've led the witness with the with the idea that that it's motor oil, fresh motor oil in color, but there's a heft to this, and part of that is nasal texture, but part of that is just like the heft you imagine when you. S- now, granted, this doesn't look like it's sherried. It doesn't smell like it's sherried. But it's the heft that you would f- sense from nosing a rich sherried whiskey, right? That depth of character coming through. Interesting. Interesting. It, it doesn't immediately jump out the glass to me as scotch. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's it's certainly got a brightness to it. There's a... Maybe like a like a warm orange peel kind of going on in the nose. All right. Like a not so sweet fruit cake, maybe? Would you yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's malty. I get malty though. Like I I'm getting if you dig deep into it, I'm getting pear drops, which is all like especially if it's bourbon cask, right? That's a telltale. I, I would, I would definitely give you pear drops on it. There's no doubt about that. But it's not the it's not the the acetone version of a pear drop, no. right? So sometimes those acetone uh, notes can be quite sharp as they present pear drops. This is a much rounder, boiled candy mm. pear drop side of things. Like a hard sweet, almost. Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, I'm thinking for our, for our US listeners, we don't think of hard candies as boiled sweets. We just call them sort of hard, <laughs> hard candies, so... You're not getting a, a, a gentle smokiness going on there. No, no, maybe a maybe a little peppery. You know, su- suggesting a, peppery, a bit sure. of activity from the cask. All right. You know, I, I think like you, you and I did when when Seabass had prepared the 
the blind barrels sample pack just for you and me that had come out of his own collection. There were a few moments in there where he was zigging and we were zagging and he you know, I think one of them was a, a Polish rye that he'd sent over. Was it a Polish oh, rye? Oh, yes. And neither of us really liked that one. <laughs> but, but then I think we'd opened up on the, the Japanese in there and neither one of us had really thought Japanese on it. No. So yeah. so instead of going pro on what the category could be, are, are there categories you would eliminate here? Uh, so for sure. I, I I would eliminate this being an American spirit. Oh, interesting. I, yep, interesting. I, I would eliminate this being an Indian spirit. Interesting. Your mention of Japanese has me second guessing, so I'm not <laughs> going to, <laughs> I'm not gonna count that one out. Like I really it's not Irish. I'm gonna count out Irish. Like there there's this doesn't smell like a blend, nor does it smell like a single pot still, nor does it smell like single malt that you'd get from Cooley or Bushmills, where you get that sort of uh, sour apple, that green apple mixed with, you know, copper penny note going on. Like, none of that's there. I'm getting some chocolate building on the nose. All right. Well, I could see that. This smells so familiar. I feel like I've had this in my glass before. So, 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 just to be clear, when you're talking about one of the five that should be on everybody's shelf, were you thinking Krigeliki? I was. I was thinking Krigeliki yeah. thirteen, yeah. possibly. Yeah. All right. Let's give it a taste and see yeah. if we can make more sense of this nose or even this global region. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm. 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 So. Interesting. Super soft, velvety texture to it. Oh, does it getting fresh bandages on the palate? If you were getting a, a little lick of sn- of smoke on yeah. the nose, that's the manifestation for me on the palate. But we're not we're not going so. Fresh bandages, I get. You usually get that because it's this like this clinical thing, right? It's it's that very sterile kind of quality, but medicinal. But right, verging on medicinal, but it's not medicinal verging on coastal or iodine. Like this does not mm, feel no. like an isla. It doesn't. It's also interesting because as much as I'm talking about the oils on it and really lining the glass when I first brought it into my mouth it felt like a 40% or a 43% or right off the bat but when I poured it the bubbles were everywhere and so I'm, mm. I'm, I'm probably going to sit and give this a little shake as you, you either talk about your notes or give it another taste. Well, Because I'm, I'm a yeah. little discombobulated right now between what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing in the mouth. Yeah, so there is zero alcohol prick, like zero alcohol prickle to this. Um, and it could be like you had mm. Woodenville in your mm. glass, which was high ABV. I had a bit of Catoctin Creek in my glass, which was also high ABV. So it could simply be that we went from something cask strength to something that is 46. And therefore, we're not getting that alcohol prickle that that we would. However, I would have a tough time suggesting this is below 46 simply because of the texture. Like at 40 or 43 percent alcohol, chances are the distillery would have chill filtered their whiskey, which would have made this a thin whiskey, which would have potentially made it a bit hot or hotter to to the sense. But it's not. It's full on velvet. Like it's it's all silk all the time. You can't hear it, <laughs> but I'm sitting here st- staring at my glass and staring at the sample bottle because I'm trying to work out what the hell this is. I'm only because of the very point you just made there, Joshua, which is if this is lower in ABV, but 
it feels rich and it looks rich and the bubbles are there. Is this something from Compass Box? Is this my beloved Glasgow blend? Nah. Right? There's there's a bit of the smoke sneaking around the back of the fruit. There's a bit of chocolatey. There's a very soft entry, but Compass Box isn't chill filtered at that 43%. So if you look at the back of the bottle... <laughs> <laughs> Time to start you'll, gleaning. Right? <laughs> gleaning you'll some see details. a government warning, but there's an ABV on this, and the ABV states 46. Yeah. Right? There so there, that's like the one clue that we have. And I we feel also, like that's cheating. Yeah, that's cheating. It is a bit cheating. But listen, we also have this. This is sort of a cool thing that comes with the Blind Barrels sample pack. It has this, you know, we've talked about the tasting wheel before, which helps you sort of whittle down where the flavors could potentially be coming from and, and things like that. And they have a similar thing on their on the inside of their tasting pack. There's an insert here that has a thing called the tasting table that like says here are this here are the flavors associated with the cereal, you know, with the wood, with the spice, you know, and, and so on. Like fainty notes and floral notes and that's kinda cool to look at. I I would go so far as to say if the goal of blind barrels is yeah. to expose you to things you haven't had previously, but to encourage you to buy bottles of things you like, this is cracking. This is I, really, really delicious. I was gonna and ask you if you liked it. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. There's there's nothing on the palate. There was nothing on the nose to begin with, but continuing that process, there's nothing on the palate that would take me back to bourbon or back to rye. Yeah. I've, if this is an American single malt, it's an American single malt that I want to buy and get to know intimately. The way the nose builds on the palate, the flavors that are there, the hospital bandages, mm. the fruit, the brightness, the presence of what I would imagine is barley yeah. has me in Scotland, but could it be English? Could it be... Mm, okay. I know we don't really want to go down the path of it being Indian. It, it doesn't seem to have that tropical mm. fruit node or some of the cardamom that you might get there or the, the, the candied coriander that you quite like. I just or is what is it you talk about getting the what's the candied seed that you get at Indian restaurants that you like fennel seeds yeah candied fennel seeds oh okay candied yeah, fennel really all right nice, gotcha yeah. gotcha um, um all right so okay let me ask you this if you were to guess an age on it eight to thirteen. It's a wide net. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said five to thirteen, but I didn't. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> eight to thirteen. Okay. All right. Fair. I mean, it's it's an answer. You gave me. I asked for. I asked for an answer. You gave me one. All right. Well, what age would you? What would you say? You're more uh, confident about just saying numbers, whether you're right or not. I like to kind of hedge my bets on whether I've got plausible deniability. Not knowing anything about this, I would, and, and given the complexity, like it, it really evolves uh, as you go on. The flavors build on the palate, yet somehow it gets softer and softer and softer on the palate. I don't know how this whiskey is doing that. I've, I haven't, I don't recall a time where I've experienced this level of velvetiness, I've, viscosity, sure, but a velvety quality to it is really remarkable, which has me thinking that this isn't Kregelki, but it has Kregelki like tones. Anyway, to answer your question, if I were to guess, I would say that it's probably nine, nine to 12. <laughs> 
<laughs> I said to 8 to 12, and you were like, that's all. You said 8 to 13. Oh, yes, okay, I, you've, you've right. gone within yeah. me on uh, both yeah, ends. Jason. All right. okay, yeah, you've, Jason. You've gone inside my bookends. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I'm getting I'm getting a, an oatmeal raisin cookie quality on the palate oh, here. Oh, interesting. All right, well, I, I had... It's so good, I had to pour myself a little more, so... Right. I, I poured myself a rather large one to begin with, and I'm just sitting here thoroughly enjoying it and so glad mm. that I did that. It tastes both familiar and new. The the oatmeal cookie with the hospital bandages is is somewhat familiar to me. I don't think it's quite as malty as I remember Craig Elicky 13 being. Oh, interesting. All right, okay, so let me let me ask you so you do you think that that's time and cask stripping away some of the maltiness? Do you think cuz you did mention smokiness, do you think it's some of the smokiness muting some of the maltiness for you? No. No, I I oh gosh. I'm almost certain this is under 13 years old. And and while I'm hedging my bets against it actually being Craig Elicky 13, I think it's 12 or under. How? What's the lowest you'll go? <laughs> <laughs> How low can you go? How low I can would, you go? I would not go lower than eight. <laughs> so you haven't changed your answer at all. You've just like said just the said same thing with more words. Okay. Do you want the reveal? Well, let's let's do it. This well, way. we we should we should at least make a guess each. We at least need to put okay. our foot in our mouth so that our listeners can enjoy our failure. Because that's that's all a blind tasting is. It's a setup for failure. I liked it when we had the answer sheet from the Macbeth samples, and we were really just picking within. Mm. We could, there was only eight, eight different ways we could go right, and as we got each one right, it cut down the number of places we could go. This is the entire world, and and Blind Barrels could absolutely throw us a curveball as well. So. so I I don't think it's Krigeliki. I actually feel as if it's potentially a blended malt. I, I don't sense any <laughs> grain in here, but I don't necessarily think that it's a compass box blended malt because nothing about this says compass box to me. It's oh, you need to drink more Glasgow blend. You need to drink much more of that. Uh, um, yeah, maybe I do, but yeah, this this doesn't seem like Glasgow blend to me. It seems something other. So, I, uh, part of me wonders if this is just a you know a bl- a blended malt of some sort, uh, Scottish, likely. I don't know who else, so you, would, where else a blended malt would come from. So, yeah. So are you suggesting an independently bottled blended malt out of Scotland at 46%? Yeah, like a blended malt, like from an independent bottler, right? Like a, like a, like a Dougie Lang blended malt or, or, or something like that. Because the age is eluding me as well, which which makes me think that maybe there's a range of ages. You know, the fact that, I don't know, there's just, there's a lot of different things going on. And partially because I'm having a di- difficult time pinpointing things, I want to believe that it's a marriage of a few things. Yeah. Expertly yeah, it's, done, by the way. I right, really like and that, that's name. the thing. It, it's a It's a complex dram that when you break it down goes in different directions I just I'm just not getting pronounced malt I am getting more of the smoke the more I layer this on my palate Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know where to position this I really really don't but I I Fuck it. I'm going to go Scotland and who knows. I think your blended malt makes sense from what you and I are sitting here tasting. If this ends up being American, I will be surprised and I will be very <laughs> pleasantly surprised. So I remember us having this all of this conversation and then we unleashed the, the Japanese reveal and we were like, right? oh, yeah, we're like oh, 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 so I'm, okay. I'm ready to have that type of reaction on this as well. Okay, so 
Let's. <laughs> so you're using a QR code over there? Is that, is I, that what I you're used doing? a QR code, which brought me to a okay. link that says, click to open samples A, sample B, sample oh, C, good. and D. Good. And so it's So we don't on accidentally see B, C, D. Yeah. Excellent. Yep, yep, yep. So let's do it this way. So let, let's let's start off with their notes. Um, yeah, color, please, please. color and appearance reflects reflexive apple juice. I think they mean reflective. I don't know what reflexive. Although is. I do like the idea of apple juice sitting there, being like, "Man, do I exist? Though, are other <laughs> apple juices real?" That's good. <laughs> Aroma notes: sweet hickory smoke. Cinnamon, mm. baked apple, plum, and cider. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, baked apple for sure. Definitely getting that. Cider's yeah. interesting. They're going an apple route there. Yeah. That hickory smoke has got me already yeah. nervous. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I, I, I can tell you. I see what it is. I know what it is. We are both so wrong. Um, uh, tasting notes. Roasted peppers, grilled peaches, apple pie, and creamy malt. Creamy malt? Okay. Creamy All right. I definitely get something you know, representing a bit more of the smoke on the palate. Okay. Finish. Long, soft, long, soft tingle on the front of your palate. Ginger, nutmeg, and oak. And then... And then I'm gonna I'm gonna do this really quickly. Our take. You ready? Yeah. Our take. Blank is a blank of whiskey that is currently exploding in the blank. <laughs> blank is a standard of whiskey throughout the world. Oh uh, yeah, I can't do this. I'll, all I'll be saying is blanks. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what it is, and then I'll give you yeah. the take. You yeah. ready? Yeah. This is a three-year-old okay. American single malt whiskey. Good Dude, you and I are going to hang on it being single malt. <laughs> That's all we're going to hang on here. Well, yeah, we, we said single, single malt. malt so did, yeah, we say, did, we, or did we not say single malt? I heard, I heard you say single malt. Did you hear me say it? Oh, shit. We said blended malt at the end, though. Fuck. <laughs> so let the record show that I'm pouring a second sample. So the distillery is known yeah. as Santa Fe Spirits in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I just oh, was a few weeks back. Awesome. I've heard wonderful things about them. This is the first thing I've ever had from them. Yep. Oh, yeah. so so glad this is my first. So that's the distillery. The name yeah. of the brand is called Colkegan Single Malt Whiskey. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Three years of age. It's 46% yeah. alcohol, and the mash bill is 100% mesquite smoked malted barley. Yeah. Cracking. Well done. Well, yeah. done. well done. That mesquite smoke is soft. Like, to the, to the point that I wasn't getting on the nose, I was getting smoke manifesting on the palate. Well, for me, mesquite seems so very singular a scent. And the fact that this came through as smoke and not necessarily a mesquite smoke, I find kind of intriguing. Like, you know, when I see mesquite anything, I'm like, oh, it, it's like it's like getting anything that has truffle oil in it. You know there's mm -hmm. no avoiding the truffle yeah. oil that's in there. And so... Yeah. I, when I see mesquite, I'm like, uh, okay, I, it's a flavor that I love. Do I just want only that in my glass? And Delbach has proven to us that that's not all you're going to get, right? Delbach makes great mesquite smoked mm -hmm. whiskeys. And, and here we are, just another fine example of, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Mesquite smoke can do some really interesting and fun things. And we both said we would buy the shit out of this. So... There you go. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And did, did you say there? I I don't know if I if I missed it or not. Did you say what the cask is? Um, da 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 da. The cask is not mentioned. However, oh look at that! You go to the Blind Barrels website, and there's a buy now thing on their website, yeah, which is which Makes is sense. great. So let's see. How much is this a bottle? 
Uh, Assuming it's still available or a version of this is available in, in August of 23. 59.99. Yeah. There you go. 46% mesquite smoke, soft entry, 46%. Yeah. Yeah. That's cheap. doing a lot of things right. Cheap as mesquite chips, as they say. As they say. Um, so it doesn't say anything about the cask type. I was hoping a zoom in of the of the bottle may yeah. state otherwise. But the fact that it's three years old and the color is quite light makes me think it's it's some sort of used oak. Right? And that, that's what I wanted confirmation on because there was nothing about it that was screaming new charred oak at me. And at three years old in new charred oak in Santa Fe. Who knows? Maybe, maybe it's just toasted oak or toasted oak with, with one or two char... Well, in Santa Fe, yeah. Yeah, it's probably used oak. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I tell yeah. you, man, Blind Barrels have done their job this day. That is a new one for me and one yep. I would happily buy. So check the box for success. It, right. And that is why Blind Barrels is cool. That That's that's awesome. We've now discovered a distillery that we've only heard about. The bottle is fifty nine ninety nine. That That's a pickup instantly. Um, and now I just want to explore more of what they do. So that, So that's pretty awesome. So... Listen, if you if any of this interests you, and hopefully it does, uh, Blind Barrels doesn't pay us anything. They send us samples. And if we mm-hmm. don't like it, just like we didn't like the Polish rye that they sent us before, <laughs> we will say we don't like it because that's our opinion. Um, but yeah, if, if, if this sounds interesting to you, if you want to discover new things, that's what whiskey's about, discovering new flavors, uh, blindbarrels.com, check it out. Um, and thanks again to Seabass and team for sending these samples. Uh, absolutely. Thanks to Seabass and team. I, I, just to, to reiterate something you just said a second ago, Joshua, back in ye old days when you and I had the blogs and we would say to our readers, look, go buy this bottle. It's not because we were getting kickbacks. It's not because we benefited yeah. in any way, shape or form. And we didn't want anybody wasting their money when they got there. So... If, yeah. if we are sitting here on the pad cost standing by this selection, it's because we really would drink the shit out of it. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. So cheers. Yeah. Cheers yeah, to Blind yeah. Barrels, the whole team there. Stuff. And, and cheers to Santa Fe. That is, that's lovely. I'm, I'm really, really, I'm working my way through my second pour of it. And I'm about to pour a third while you move on to this email. Oh, I love this. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to pour... Um a third as well because my second was too small for being honest my second was too small so let's let's rectify that if I pour any more I will have emptied my 50 mil bottle All right. So listen, um, I want to close this episode out with a with an email from uh, from Matt Skinny Roberts, uh, who a mensch among men. She's a mensch among mensch. Who, much like Michael Nolan, who we brought up earlier in the podcast, sent an email off the back of an episode. Uh, Matt Skinny Roberts sent an email off the back of our Felipe Schreiberg episode where we were talking about uh peat sustainability and, and and Felipe had done that whole piece on 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 peat sustainability that that we covered on extra extra Indeed. and um and so he has a he has a thought skinny's got a bit of a thought here so uh I bet the, he does the, the subject line is simply peat sustainability and he goes howdy howdy In listening to the recent PADCAST conversation with Felipe Schreiberg, something wormed its way into my goo computer, and it simply won't leave. In all the talk around sustainability and more environmentally friendly practices, there is, to me, a glaring omission in this discussion. Perhaps it has just flown under my radar, but I've not heard a single iota. Pause here really quickly. You get 10 points to Gryffindor for the use of the word iota. People don't use that word enough. Anymore. Um, 
So, uh, I haven't heard a single iota about the efficiency regarding the actual process of drying the malt with peat. If you could use peat more efficiently or the same amount of peat for a larger amount of grain, that alone mm-hmm. could drastically cut down the overall usage. And I, I do have a thought there, and I, which I'll go to in a second. He continues. Um, now, he continues. Now, I've got a piece of equipment sketched out that I'm not going to delve into, but hey, Diageo, Remy, Suntory, if you want to talk, I'll give you my <laughs> bank details for deposit. There are always ways to obtain more flavor or smoke contact. Now, maybe the Giants already know this, and will put a price on my head for bringing it up, but it's interesting to me that this hasn't entered the conversation. Anywho, apologies if this was a bit rambly. It's 5 a.m. here, and I've been up since 2, thanks to a tiny demon. Uh, I think they're referring to his new pup. And I've certainly not had sufficient bean juice. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Hope everyone is well. Look forward to hearing more about this in the future. So, Bean juice and Goo computer. Those are right. And and the use of iota. That's for a man who didn't have his full faculties by his own admission, that was a top drawer email. Chef's kiss almost, right? Uh, almost. Let's let's not give away the chef's kisses. Right, yeah. Well <laughs> not really allowed to in this day and age, so So what was your thought, Joshua? So my thought was in you know, when we when we go to Scotland and we go to Kelhoman or Laphroaig or, um, you know, any distillery that's drying their own barley with peat, and, and both of those distilleries do do that, um, or at least a percentage of their barley, it's quite it's quite a simple process, right? There's a kiln that has a second floor, and on that second floor, the floor is a steel grate. You put your barley on there and you light a peat fire beneath it and you let the smoke go up through that grate. The heat dries the barley as the smoke impregnates itself into that barley and you get as much smoke as you like and then you finish the drying process off, usually with forced hot air driven by anthracite or oil or something like that. But it's just a simple fire. Thinking back to our time in in Washington State back in February for Elijah's birthday, we got to visit Skagit Valley Maltings, and they had a very different system of mm. peating barley that is unlike anything we'd ever seen before. I, I, I honestly don't want to talk about it too much because we can't. Uh, we're not allowed to. But Given my, that we my, were not allowed to take pictures. Uh, yeah, we I weren't allowed we to take to, pictures. We need to be guarded. Um, but the fact of the matter is, even with even with a simple wood fire, you know, there are companies that have made wood pellet fireplaces that that take more advantage out of that burning wood than you would from a simple wood fire in a fireplace. So it would stand to reason that you could do the same with a fuel like peat as opposed to wood, and get more efficiency out of it. I I feel like we have circled back to where we started our episode, which is science. Science has ways of making this happen that, this might be controversial, ghosts don't. (laughs) It's just... I was just more surprised that you were able to turn back time. <laughs> you have found a way. <laughs> but it, but it's true, right? And and I remember a, a trip to Lafroig where they were talking about being more careful with Pete and being more purposeful yeah. with what they had and making less go farther. Like, th- this has been on the minds of distillers for, you know, I- I- I'm really thinking of a 2017 trip to Laphroaig where they were talking about this. And so it- it's been on their minds for a good while. And I think the way forward will be more efficient use um, in 
malting barley, drying well, barley. I, 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 you know, I think Skinny is spot on there. I, I think he's definitely onto a component of this. Listen, I can't, I can't necessarily talk to American producers of of peated spirit. However, we know those that have worked with Skagit Valley maltings, and, and we understand they they've shuttered. Hopefully, they'll be able to reopen. I haven't followed that news story much further, and, and I realize it's something that we should. But with Scotland in mind, we know that many of the major distilleries are taking green initiatives quite seriously. Um, it seems to be that many of them are doing it beyond the idea of greenwashing, just saying things to say things, that mm-hmm. they're actually mm-hmm. making substantive substantive like changes to their processes and, and, and how they just – their processes, right? Um, that if there's a way – that they'll be looking at this. But but that's the thing, right? I don't know if it's distillery driven or the company that makes ways to do things more efficiently reaches out to these distilleries and say, hey, look, if you use this, you could save on peat, you could save on your carbon footprint, right? And so on and so forth. Like, I don't know who leads that, but I think Skinny's got a great idea. It seems quite obvious. Uh, I don't know why we haven't discussed that either. Yeah, quick question. Only if you know the answer. Don't don't worry if you don't. But with Anthony Wills at Kilhoman coming out and saying, "Look, we've lost our our malting contract with Diageo and Port mm-hmm. Ellen," mm-hmm. and we're you know talking about how much they peat on site for the hundred percent Isla versus what they're getting out of Diageo. Is there a is there a sense? Going forward on on what Coleman are going to do, are are they one of these distilleries looking into? Hey, could you send us a machine that would allow us to do X, Y, and Z more efficiently to to increase how much barley we can malt on site? So I don't know the answer to that. What I do know, however, is Anthony has said. What they're building will ensure they are vertically integrated from a malting standpoint. All of the malting will be done on site. That doesn't mean all of the barley will be coming from the farm, sure, but all of the sure, malting will. Sure. And that it's an investment that, you know, we're looking in the millions of pounds, right? So, For sure. So I don't know, but they have the opportunity here. If there is something available for them to incorporate that in into that purchase, so it becomes a it becomes a wait and see thing. Um, you know, having said that, it's now a question we need to ask Anthony, right? And, and, right. and maybe he's willing to. That's the one thing about Anthony. If he doesn't want to share something, <laughs> he'll just say, "I can't tell you," or he'll or he will like, and so. Worst that can happen is we ask him the question and he tells us to fuck off. And we say, <laughs> off we fuck. <laughs> and those will be his exact words. <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah, cheer, cheers to Skinny for, for sending that in. And you know, I, I know that he's thinking things with his head brains while he's busy working away at Copperworks. And, and, and more power to him. He's a, he's a good lad and a thoughtful lad and, and a lad who's good for this industry. So cheers to you, Skinny. I, yeah. I lift my Santa Fe to you. I, I will lift some Copperworks to you later. I have Copperworks right here, Jason, and I'm pouring it right now. <laughs> if I could pour Copperworks... I put it in my glass. All right. So listen, Jason, I'm actually pouring this in one other dram, Jason. And this other dram I'm going to enjoy right now. The Copperworks I'm going to enjoy a bit later, but I'm pouring this first dram. Uh, it is Isle of Raze. Hey! And it let, was... let me reach for my Isle of... Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, right. go on. I'll kind of continue. And I'm going to raise this to our friend, William Dobby. Thank you so much again for, for joining us. Um, thanks, too, to, to Michael Nolan and to Matt Skinny Roberts for, for writing in. For, 
really for listening in and saying, hey, sh- you you guys didn't tend to this. Like, you missed this. Please, let's talk about this. <laughs> it's it's nice to hear that people are invested in some of the conversations that we're having. So So thank you for that. Cheers. And I'm also raising my glass to, even though we did this before, I'm raising my glass to uh, to Sea Bass and, and and the good folks at Blind Barrel. So, so listen, if like Michael Nolan or like Matt Skinny Roberts, you've got a question and it's burning and you need to ask us, please email us questions at one nation under whiskey dot com or info at singlecastnation.com and, and we'll do our very best to get to it and. You know, it's, it's still the summertime. Whiskey stories tend to be a bit scant this time of year. So if you find something and you want us to cover it, even if it's whiskey adjacent, uh, shoot us that story. Same email address as apply. And, and we'll, you know, maybe we'll base an episode of Extra Extra off an article that you found interesting. So um, if, if you have a burning question, consider us the cooling cream with which to solve. <laughs> On that note, Jason, I raise glasses. Cheers. Cheers.